Such stressed mothers became the focus of a study by Dr. Blackburn's colleague, psychologist Alyssa Eppel. Mothers of young children are a highly stressed group. They're often balancing competing demands like work and child rearing. Um, and often don't have time to take care of themselves. So if you add on top of that the extra burden of caring for a child with special needs, it can be overwhelming. It can tax the very reserves that sustain people. And if they're stressed, if they report stress, they tend to die earlier. These women have shortened telomeres, decreased activity of this enzyme, and very, very rough number for every year you were taking care of a chronically ill child, you got roughly six years worth of aging. This is real. This is not just somebody whining. This is real medically serious aging going on, and we can see that it's actually caused by the chronic stress. But there is hope. Dr. Blackburn co-discovered an enzyme, telomerase, that can repair the damage. It's what I always call the threat of hope. <laughs> <laughs> Preliminary data suggests that a meeting of minds such as this may actually have a health benefit by stimulating the healing effects of telomerase. And laugh. And laugh. If you don't, if you don't laugh, forget it. You can't handle it. It's... <laughs> What I found is that the humor is something, if there's a certain level of black humor that we have about our kids that only we appreciate. We're the only ones who get the jokes, and in a way, we're the only ones who are allowed to laugh at the jokes. One of the questions in the stress field is, you know, what are the active ingredients that reduce stress and that promote longevity and compassion and, and caring for others may be one of those most important ingredients. So those may be the factors that promote longevity and increase telomerase and keep our cells rejuvenating and regenerating. So perhaps connecting with and helping others can help us to mend ourselves and maybe even live longer, healthier lives. 20 years ago, Robert got a shocking preview of this idea. The first troop he ever studied, the baboons he felt closest to and had written books about, suffered a calamity. It would have a profound effect on his research. The Kikarok troop is the one I started with 30 years ago. And they were your basic old baboon troop at the time, and which means males were aggressive and society was highly stratified and females took a lot of grief and your basic off-the-rack baboon troop. And then about, by now, almost 20 years ago, something horrific and scientifically very interesting happened to that troop. The Kikarok troop took to foraging for food in the garbage dump of a popular tourist lodge. It was a fatal move. The trash included meat tainted with tuberculosis. The result was that nearly half the males in the troop died. Not unreasonably, I got uh, depressed as hell and pretty damn angry about what happened. You know, here. You're 30 years old, you can afford to expend a lot of emotion on a baboon troop, and there was a lot of emotion there. For Robert, a decade of research appeared to have been lost. But then he made a curious observation about who had died and who had survived. It wasn't random who died. In that troop, if you were aggressive, and if you were not particularly socially connected, socially affiliated, you didn't spend your time grooming and hanging out, if you were that kind of male, you died. Every alpha male was gone. The Kikarok troop had been transformed. And what you were left with was twice as many females as males, and the males who were remaining were, you know, just to use scientific jargon, they were good guys. They were not aggressive jerks. They were nice to the females. They were very socially affiliative. It completely transformed the atmosphere of the troop. When male baboons reach adolescence, they typically leave their home troop and roam, eventually finding a new troop. 
And when new adolescent males would join the troop, they'd come in just as jerky as any adolescent males elsewhere on this planet, and it would take them about six months to learn, we're not like that in this troop. We don't do stuff like that. We're not that aggressive. We spend more time grooming each other. Males are calmer with each other. You do not dump on a female if you're in a bad mood. And it takes these new guys about six months and they assimilate this style. And you have baboon culture. And this particular troop has a culture of very low levels of aggression and high levels of social affiliation. And they're doing that 20 years later. And so the tragedy had provided Robert with a fundamental lesson not just about cells, but how the absence of stress could impact society. Do these guys have the same problems with high blood pressure? Nope. Do these guys have the same problems with brain chemistry related to anxiety, stress hormone levels? Not at all. It's not just your rank. It's what your rank means in your society. And the same is true for humans, with only a slight variation. We belong to multiple hierarchies, and you may have the worst job in your corporation and no autonomy and control and predictability, but you're the captain of the company softball team that year, and you better bet you are going to have all sorts of psychological means to decide it's just a job, nine to five, that's not what the world is about. What the world's about is softball, I'm the head of my team, people look up to me, and you come out of that deciding you are on top of the hierarchy that matters to you. <laughs> Lots of baboon poop, which, under the right circumstances with the right seasons experiment, is a gold mine. Uh, unfortunately, this time around, it's just a cage to have to clean now. I'm studying stress for 30 years now, and I even tell people how they should live differently. So presumably, I should have incorporated all of this, and the reality is, like, I'm unbelievably stressed and type A and poorly coping, and, like, why else would I study this stuff 80 hours a week? No doubt everything I advise is going to lose all its credibility if I keel over dead from a heart attack in my early 50s. Nah, I'm not good at dealing with stress. You know, one thing that works to my advantage is I love my work and I love every aspect of it, so that's good. But nonetheless, this is pretty clearly a different place than uh, the savannah in East Africa. You know, you can do science here that's very different and more interesting in some ways. You can have hot showers on a more regular basis. It's a more interesting, varied world in lots of ways, but, you know, there's a lot out there that you sure miss. It is a pretty miraculous place where every meal tastes good and you're ten times more aware of every sensation. This is a hard place to come to year after year without getting, I think, a very different uh, metabolism and temperament. I'm more extroverted here, I'm more, more happy. Uh, it's a hard place not to be happy. So one antidote to stress may be finding a place where we have control. But how do we reckon with all the time we spend at work? I would say what we've learned from the Whitehall study, from the study of the non-human primates, is the conditions in which people live and work are absolutely vital for their health. Senior civil servant Sarah Woodhall enjoys the benefits of control. I, I don't think I suffer from stress. I, I don't work 100 hours a week. I control um, the amount of work that I do to make sure that um, I can continue to deliver long term. Control, the amount of control is intimately related to where you are in the occupational hierarchy. And what we have found is in general, where people report to us that things have got worse, that the amount of work stress has gone up, their illness rates go up. 
where people report to us that they've got more control, they're being treated more fairly at work, there's more justice in the amount of treatment, so things are getting better.